I'm going to breeze through these remarks and I'm really looking forward to hearing from Savannah because I think now um, in this workshop you're hearing two really cutting edge kinds of issues um, that are confronting us today with the street gangs and then the back page. Um, so um, let me just start by saying that, that we stumbled on this issue um, right after I left the State Department. Uh, I um, formed Global Centurion. We wanted to work on the demand side of, of, of human trafficking because most of you know there's this triangle of activity, supply, demand, distribution, just like in drug trafficking. And the supply is the people who are being sold, whether it's men, women, and children, whether it's sex trafficking or labor trafficking. And the distributors or the traffickers, they're in it for the money. Uh, and they would do something else if they weren't making a lot of money off this. And the demand side is, the, these are the buyers, whether, again, whether it's labor trafficking or sex trafficking or organ trafficking, um, they're corporate or they're individuals, and those purchasers are fueling the market for uh, human trafficking. And, and, and that seemed to me, when I left the State Department, to be the neglected side of the triangle of activity. Um, and so we, we, we started to work on that. And in so doing, we were gathering case law from all around the world. And, and uh, at this point, the International Case Law Database is about 7,500 strong. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we've been uh, creating sort of specialized databases pulling out um, information and then um, taking data from each case. So e the case law, each, each case is a different case. You can get the trial transcripts, you can get the, uh, the um, indictments, you can get a lot of information and you can pull out um, variables, data points on the victim, data points on the perpetrators, data points on the crime itself. And so you can create victim profiles, perpetrator profiles, uh, crime profiles that r help you to, to understand from past cases what the trends and patterns are and how, where they're moving. And as part of, of the this, as we were uh, beginning this um, gathering of these cases, um, a couple of my students came to me and said, look at this, uh, you know, here's a case where uh, there's a street gang and at first they were in Nairobi and then there was one in Mexico and um, and then I, 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 as, 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 I, as we saw about four or five more, I said, let's just search the whole database for street gang activity in, in, um, in sex trafficking. And um, that was 2011. 2010, I left the State Department. 2011, we did this first search. And lo and behold, 200 cases came up. Nobody had, had thought about this before. And the first thing we did was go, oh my gosh. Um, there is huge involvement in this, and this, the Justice Department and DHS are missing this because they're usually focused on some other aspect, some really bad criminal activity like murder, extortion, you know, that gangs are involved in. And so they're not really, they're either not charging this or they're charging it, but they're not really pursuing it in the, in the, uh, in the court because they've got you know, bigger fish to fry. But when we started to look at it just for their activity in pros prostitution and, and uh, pimping and pandering and procuring and sex trafficking as the law began to be used more, we started to uncover these. So, um, so I'm just gonna give you a little, uh, um, you know, a feel for what we uh, found. Now, how do I move this? Uh, is this it? Yeah, okay, you've seen this one. So, um, and, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Savannah. Okay, so, so, um, uh, our wake-up call was this, call, this uh, case in 1998, the case of, uh, of dozens and indeed hundreds of women and children who were trafficked into the United States um, from Mexico and mostly across the uh, border to Texas and then from Texas um, driven through Louisiana and into Florida into a small town in Avon Park, Florida. And I'll maybe tell you a little bit about that uh, case later. But basically what we found is that in, since then is that every state in the United States has had uh, trafficking cases, labor trafficking and sex trafficking cases. I had to do this by hand with my little triangles and um, <laughs> because, uh, because the, the Justice Department has not 
uh, tabulated and mapped in any way any of the trafficking cases. Um, and so I'm trying to, we've now um, analyzed about 550 or so cases in the U.S. of what we call organized crime and street gangs are one of those kinds of organized crime. And I've got them up to 2009. I've got to catch up now, about seven years worth that I've got to catch up on this map. But um, here's what they've done for street gangs. They've been working on street gangs a lot longer, and I'm trying to um, urge, encourage, pressure um, the DOJ and DHS to do the same kind of mapping of, of the trafficking cases as they're doing for the um, street gangs. These are the, all the arrests, but there have been also then uh, uh, the, uh, you know, investigations, arrests, prosecutions, convictions. And you can see that there's enormous activity. And, and what we have found is that that um, because of the concern about gang, um, uh, criminal gang activity, Congress has uh, passed laws, um, not, a law, not a federal law prohibiting gang activity, but they've passed laws um, uh, allocating money, so um, authorizing and appropriating money for gang and gang activity that allowed um, gang task forces to be set up probably around the year 2000, 2001 or two. And those gang task forces, um, I think there are about 40, uh, six or 48 of them now in the, in, the, uh, in the US. And they track all of the gang arrests and gang activities and then they report them back to a centralized kind of quasi governmental um, organization um, that uh, the closest we have is Polaris Project, but we don't really have anything like this on trafficking. But it, it allows that um, aggregated information about what's going on in, 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 in gangs and gang arrests. And we need the same thing for, for trafficking. So, and here's, here's another map that, uh, that we, we just did to sort of show gang arrests and sort of where the big activity is. And it's, you know, where you would kind of expect. It's California, Texas, Florida, um, the, east, uh, the e eastern uh, coast. There's a lot of activity, um, uh, gang activity in those cases. And here um, we've, we've uh, we've calculated some of the arrests for ga gang activity from 2005 to the present. California, D.C., or D.C. area, um, Texas, North Carolina, and um, New York are the, the, where we've had the most arrests and uh, prosecutions. Now, this doesn't mean that this is the place where the, the, all get the gang activity is going on. This means we have really great police officers and prosecutors who are on this, and, and we need this all around the country for both gangs, uh, gang activity and for trafficking. Um, so um, a lot of my, uh, um, now I don't know why this says 2009, because my, I've, I've been pulling from the 2014 and uh, 15 National Gang Threat Assessment. They do it every two years. They do um, a report. And um, this is the definition that they use for gangs. It's a group of three or more uh, persons who have a common identifying symbol, name, sign, and who individually or collectively engage in or have engaged in a pattern of criminal activity. So they're criminal gang, criminal street gangs. And um, since uh, the uh, gang task forces began, they now divide gangs into street gangs, prison gangs, and motorcycle gangs, sort of outlaw motorcycle gangs as opposed to um, you know, a, a gang of guys who might ride motorcycles. In fact, there's a really famous Wesleyan preacher who rides his motorcycle up onto the stage and, and then preaches, and he's not one of these guys. <laughs> um, but um, so just th those who are, do who, are, who are involved in criminal activity. Um, and so these, um, these threat assessments, they're saying approximately one million gang members belong to 20,000 or more gangs in, that are criminally active in the United States today. And all these are pictures of gang members where there's been an arrest and a prosecution and a conviction. Um, criminal gangs commit 80% of the crime in communities. Um, and um, they uh, have 58% of state and law, local law enforcement agencies are reporting that criminal gangs were active in their jurisdictions in 2008 compared with 45 in 2004. So it's growing. Um, uh, it, or it has been until until we we uh, began to you know to to really address it. Whoops, sorry. Um, 
So, and I started to tell you about the typical gang-related uh, uh, crimes, um, alien smuggling, armed robbery, assault, auto theft, drug trafficking, extortion, fraud, home invasions, identity theft, weapons trafficking, murder. These are, you know, really serious crimes that, that uh, plague communities. And um, the other notation that the uh, gang threat assessment uh, uh, report found was that that gangs we used to think of street gangs as kind of those young guys that hung out on the corner and um, that's just not the case anymore they're increasingly more sophisticated and organized um, and they're linked up they're linked up with the larger cartels and syndicates um, in the US and abroad and the case law is beginning to prove that um, so now I'm just going to give you some examples of the kinds of gang. I took the top 10. The, uh, if you look at this gang threat assessment, you can see there they have a list of, of uh, the, um, I, I think there's two or 300 of the largest gangs, but there are many, many more because they're always splitting and they have sort of subgroups um, uh, uh, that, uh, that have their own names. But I took the top 10 and I just looked um, through our case law database for street gang activity um, and sex trafficking. And we, we haven't done labor trafficking. We, we have not looked at, or at uh, alien smuggling and at visa fraud. We need to do that. That's something else I think that they're very involved in. But we wanted specifically to know what was going on in the street gangs uh, with sex trafficking. So this is the Crips. And this gives you a little bit of information about uh, who they are, how long they've been uh, at work uh, or you know uh, active since they were formed, so 1970. That's 30, that's almost 50 years that they've been uh, active in the U.S. Their membership is um, ab above 300,000. They have a, uh, you know, a um, fight to the death rivalry with the Bloods. And they have lots of criminal activities uh, that they've been involved in um, that are sort of their classic uh, um, uh, crimes. But I put in red prostitution, commercial sexual exploitation of minors, pimping and pandering and procuring because we found cases of that, but it, we, it had just not been noted before. And here's an example, arrest in, in uh, Virginia in 2012 of a Crips leader who ran an underage prostitution ring using social media to recruit and target minors, underage uh, victims, um, sometimes using classmates to do the recruiting paying $100 per recruitment for classmates who recruited, and then victims were forced to have sex with up to 15 men a night, and they were making this profit of $1,000 uh, or, or, or more. And um, one th I think you'll see, start to see themes running through, regardless of the, the gangs, they are targeting younger and younger um, uh, people, and, um, and there's a reason for that. Um, and they're using the schools, they're using social media, they're using the, the, you know, the networks that kids use to connect with each other. That's what they're using. Um, here's another one, 2011, Crips in San Diego. So they're all across the United States. They're in most big cities. Uh, three dozen Crips street gang members and two motel owners indicted for running an online prostitution ring that targeted underage girls. And they used MySpace and Craigslist and Twitter and Facebook to both recruit and to sell. And, um, and it, it says that they, they actually uh, worked together to, um, with rival factions to, to target the underage girls from broken homes, which is a, another, um, you know, we don't give, a lot of times we don't give these, these gang members, they're, they're very smart. They're smart businessmen. Um, they're smart in terms of their business model and their modus operandi. And um, they know exactly where to go to look for somebody who's, who, who, who is, is broken or damaged or in need of some kind of, you know, of care. And, um, and that's what they target. This is another Crips arrest. I'm going to zip through these because um, I just want to give you some examples of these. This was a big, huge, the huge case in um, Los Angeles in 2009. Over 1,000 females were working for this Crips gang um, locally, and they had uh, 47 members who were the, the, the traffickers associated with this, and, and, and uh, they were all arrested. They had a huge booking right, right on the street there. They had a 
a table where they were booking them. Um, um, the Bloods, that's the, the, uh, you know, the rivalry with the Crips, and they're about three years younger than the, um, or older than the Crips. And here's their membership, seven to 30,000, so they're a little bit smaller. And again, the same kinds of activities which hadn't been noticed until we began to pull these out. Um, and here's a Bloods uh, arrest in 2015, a member of Bloods gang arrested for prostituting a 16-year-old. Um, the minor victim was transported to the hospital after he violently attacked her when she refused to do something that he wanted her to do. And he had advertised her online. Um, and uh, I, so I guess it was more than an arrest. It's, he, he was sentenced in 2016 to, to a few years in prison. Um, uh, another Bloods um, in Orange County, California. I won't read all of these, um, and, and I'm happy to share the, this slideshow with you if, if it can be helpful. Another Bloods arrest in Brooklyn in 2010, and um, here girls as young as 15 routinely beaten if they didn't uh, you know, cooperate, deprived of food. They had a quota that they had to make, and um, a little bit later in this slideshow, I add up, I sort of do totals to show why these gang members are turning more to trafficking human beings and, and, and um, not, not turning away from drugs, but just adding the human beings because there's an enormous amount of money to be made in this. Um, another Bloods arrest in Seattle. See, so here, members of the West Side Mob, that's a sub-chapter sub of the, the Bloods. Um, or they're associated with the Bloods, but they have a different name and you wouldn't know it unless you, you knew their history. And another thing that we're pretty sure of is that um, unless, there's, unless, unless they're arrested in the um, in midst of the gang activity, a lot of times these sex trafficking cases, if no one asks, we don't know that there was a, a, um, uh, a street gang involved. I've, I've just finished doing um, a survey with 250 survivors of sex trafficking, domestic survivors of sex trafficking, and we get their, um, their uh, backstory. We have them tell just kind of a story of how they were recruited, transported, harbored, um, uh, bought and sold, you know, what the modus operandi of the, the, the trafficker was. And we ask, um, was he associated with a gang? And we get so many yeses, nobody asked me that before. Actually, he was. Actually, you know, he was the leader of this gang, actually. And so unless our um, police officers um, are asking, unless our prosecutors are aware of this and are, are looking for that, that network of criminal activity, we may be just getting one trafficker when there's really an association with a whole street gang. Um, so this is something that we need to be doing more of. Um, so here, um, uh, and, th and then um, the Latin Kings, which is Mexican and Puerto Rican, and it has just in Chicago alone about 20,000 to 35,000 members. It's been going for many, many years since 1940 and um, has all the same kind of criminal activities, and then also prostitution, pimping, pandering, procuring. Sometimes these um, uh, gang members are arrested and they're charged with prostitution of an underage um, you know, or a minor, and that's sex trafficking. That's per se sex trafficking, but they're being charged with prostitution or with pimping or with uh, pandering, and, and uh, so we're missing the sex trafficking part unless we go back to those early cases and look for that and look for any prostitution charge with a, an underage girl as the victim. That's, that's per se sex trafficking. Um, here's the Latin Kings um, case in Chicago. Um, part of a conspiracy of 17 Latin King uh, members. Um, another one in the District of Columbia. Um, and then Gangster Disciples is also another very uh, um, big gang that started in the late 1960s, has a big membership, um, 43,000 in Chicago alone. And um, uh, same kinds of things. I don't know why this is, it's funny. It's the, the, the um, they're not lining up here, and so sorry for the, it looks like I can't spell, but I, I actually can spell <laughs> pandering. It's just the, the P's are all, 
uh, up there. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, but anyway, so I apologize. Um, but, but this gives you an idea of what's going on in our country and what's been going on under our noses for many, many years. Um, here's another gangster disciple in El Paso, Texas. Um, these kids were um, then uh, they, were tra they were recruited, they, they were trafficked into private dances, massage, body rubs, online commercial sex. Um, here's another one in Palm Beach, Florida, and I'm just trying to show you that, uh, that, that this is not in one city or another, it's all over the United States, and we need that same kind of map that they're doing for all gang arrests we need for, uh, for trafficking. Um, Spokane, Washington, another, they're, they're big in Spokane, Washington, in, wa in the state of Washington, gangster disciples. Um, 40 fe federal crime charges against 24 gang members, including prostituting juveniles. Um, and Nuestra Familia, another, this one, another Latin gang, um, Mexican, Mexican Americans. Um, and, um, here, somebody was interviewed from inside a, pr a prison, and he said, and they said, what kind of crimes were you mainly involved in? And he said, murder, money laundering, bank robberies, armored car robberies, drug deals, and prostitution. Um, but I don't think there were any charges, but, but somebody had the sense to ask him, and he said, we're, you know, we're doing it. Um, Mexican mafia, similar kinds of, of things. Um, here's a big case in Corpus Christi, Texas in 2016. 19 members of the Mexican Mafia are indicted on racketeering charges, including um, narcotics and also prostitution. And where I read prostitution, if there's violence involved, if there's force, fraud, or coercion, um, uh, if there's a minor involved, it's per se trafficking, which is why we need to be looking more carefully at these cases. Um, to help people understand, uh, because uh, you know, we still have this misnomer about prostitution. Oh, well, that was just a little prostitution. Oh, this is sex trafficking. That's terrible. No, they're actually. If you look at our law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, it defines sex trafficking as a commercial act in exchange for something of value, and so that's prostitution without any even force, fraud, or coercion. Um, so, um, and, and so I'm just, you know, going through, this is a very um, famous case. This is the case where, if you remember 26, um, undocumented uh, aliens were dis discovered in a locked um, truck inside a freezer, in a, in a truck in Imperial, California. The uh, driver knew that the police were following him. He pulled over, abandoned the truck, and they found these, these, um, uh, these, people who were being trafficked inside this uh, freezer, and they were um, being trafficked by the Mexican Mafia, which is a, a, a gang that has, has it's, it's active here in the US and it's active in Mexico. And just so you know that it's, these are equal opportunity exploiters, um, you know, they're, they're black, they're white, they're uh, Latin, they're, you know, um, and, and, they're, and they're trafficking across um, race, um, gender, across socioeconomic barriers. I mean, this is theirs, uh, or, you know, um, categories. So uh, there's no one, sometimes people ask me, what's the bad, really bad gang? Well, there isn't any only one really bad gang. There are a lot of them, and they're active um, all across the United States. And, um, and they're targeting our children um, uh, of, in, in, of all um, races and um, uh, you know, colors and, and from uh, richest to poorest or poorest to richest. We had, when we were in, in Toledo, Ohio, we uh, had a case of a, um, a young woman who said that uh, she was trafficked by a police officer who was corrupt and his brother was part of a gang. Um, she was the daughter of the wealthiest family in Toledo. And um, he was a very handsome police officer, but also corrupt. And she was trapped in this trafficking situation for several years be before she got out. So um, uh, it's not only poor people um, either. 
that are, are the targets of this. So, and here's another Aryan Brotherhood um, uh, member involved with narcotics, prostitution, other illegal activities. And sometimes they're even trafficking from inside the jails when they're in there. Um, they're either running, in, they're running prostitution rings in the jails and prisons, or they're trafficking, they're, they're, they're the sort of kingpin that's, that's calling the shots for those who are still on the outside um, and making a lot of money from it. And this is an Asian uh, American, Chinese American triad secret society gang in San Francisco and Los Angeles, also in Hong Kong. Um, uh, and membership about 7,000, or at least this is what they, they, um, uh, they, get, they estimate. And this uh, gang had a particular, they, they robbed the brothels and, and, and um, targeted brothels and robbed the brothels of, um, as well as running them. So it was kind of a funny thing here. So prostitution and robbery of competitive brothels. That's, that's, um, that was the thing, 12 defendants. And they also were distributing ecstasy. That was another one of their, um, uh, the crimes that they were involved in. 18th Street Gang, same thing. This is there in, in Los Angeles also doing identity document forgery and fraud. So this just uh, is to show you that, that um, I mean, when we started this and I, when we first noticed this pattern, 2011, I called the Department of Justice and I asked them to come in and, and look at what we had found on our, our uh, case law database. And they basically said, well, it's just, you know, it's an isolated case here and an isolated case there. And then when we turned up 200 of these cases, we called them back again. And um, shortly after that, they, um, they put out a memo and they brought the two um, task forces. So the trafficking uh, community has its task forces. There are about, there used to be 42 of them. I think there are 20 or 30 now. And the gang task forces, and they were running parallel. They were meeting in each state, but they were never talking to each other. They finally brought those task forces, the DOJ task forces, those two task forces together in their, each of their uh, states or vicinities. And then we began to see the, um, the kinds of arrests that we're recording now. And you can see that most of these um, are, are from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. They're after we called this to the attention of the Justice Department. Um, oops, I'm going backwards. Um, okay. So, and MS-13, I just want to spend a little bit of time on that because in Fairfax, Virginia, where I come from, we've had 22 cases of MS-13 gang members who are trafficking middle school and high school kids. And um, they have a modus operandi, they kind of do a Romeo thing, and they, they, um, they have their younger members go to the high schools, meet girls, they hold um, what they call, um, uh, they're, 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 they're private parties, skip parties, they're called skip parties. And they, they invite the kids to skip school and come and party with them and they have alcohol and you know um, food and other things and they, they kind of do the equivalent of the young people's whining and dining basically. And, um, and then um, they almost immediately when, they've, when, they, when they have, uh, you know, when they've gotten one of these um, kids to uh, to, to think either that, they're, that they've got a boyfriend or even when not, sometimes they're just forced right into uh, this, this trafficking. And these cases have been really gruesome and egregious. Um, here's one in Maryland, uh, 2016, an MS-13 members arrested for killing a 16-year-old male and enlisted 19-year-old um, women to, um, uh, to a park with a promise of, of sex and, and then um, trafficked trafficked her. And here is uh, MS-13 lured an underage girl from a home using um, social media and arranged um, with them to stay with other MS-13 uh, members and then coerced them into prostitution. And uh, another case, um, and these are all the pictures of these guys, they're all locked up now because we had this amazing prosecutor. We had a police force in, in Fairfax County and then we had um, the Eastern District, the federal uh, prosecutor in the Eastern District, um, Michael Frank and Zach Terwilliger. Um, they really should be going around the country and teaching all prosecutors how to do this. But they just, they just went after these, these street gangs and um, they just prosecuted case after case after case. And so it looks like we have a really active market um, uh, in, in 
uh, the Fairfax County area, but it actually is just that we're, we've cracked down on them and we're catching them. So um, this guy's modus operandi was, uh, he again, tra he, he recruited underage um, uh, girls. He, he had the clients paying $50 um, for a, you know, uh, a, t a, t a time, and um, he would go around to the places where the, Ill the um, immigrants, illegal immigrants, construction workers, if you've seen those, they hang out sometimes at 7-Eleven or in the kind of in areas where they're waiting to be picked up to be day laborers, and he had cards, he had business cards that were in Spanish, and it said, you know, buy a rose, and um, the rose was the girl, and there was a number on there, which, which was his cell phone number, and that was his, that was his clientele. So they all had a different way of, of um, you know, of, of finding, of recruiting, and marketing their, um, their goods. Yeah. More? So, yeah, but this is a big deal because we were talking about this, um, Donna and I, and, uh, and we were talking about how um, when the numbers sound so large as to be almost unbelievable, it's, it's, it doesn't do uh, a service to the anti-trafficking movement. But I will tell you that in my work with survivors, there is a modus operandi of some of these, the MS-13, a lot of the the, um, the traffickers in, um, like that Rosa case that I just showed you first, um, a lot of the the foreign national victims that we've interviewed, they they have told us, and I, so I've, I at least 15 or 20 of them have told me, yes, I laid in a bed. The guy brought in a ticket. It was a condom or it was a piece of paper. He had bought me for 10 minutes. You know, he had to get in there and get out, get in there and get out. And I worked six days a week, and therefore, and I worked from eight in the morning until such and such a time, or, you know, I worked the night shift, which was four until three in the morning. And when they, you add up those 10 minutes, it's more than 30 or 40 sometimes. So it's, it's unbelievable, and yet it's what's happening to some, and others, it, it's only seven a night, and I can't say only, that's terrible. It's seven to 10. But it's definitely, I, I take them at their word when they say, I, I laid on my back and I collected this many markers per night, and, I, and they, these guys had 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then they had to get out. They had to do, do their business and get out. Um, so that's how that large number can happen. Um, if anybody has comments or stories, I, I'd, I'd like to hear them. Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. And, and I'm not able to focus on the, the victim's side as much or the survivor side as much, but I think a lot of the good information that we can get is from survivors because they know how this works inside and out. And so if we were doing more listening and more gathering of victim intel, we would understand this better. And it is particularized in every community. And most of the ones that do are... 30, 40 a night, they were down in Florida. That's the, that whole area. That's, that's the lie on the back for, and everybody gets 10 minutes. That's the area where I heard that the most. Um, but also with these MS-13 members. I've got five minutes left, and so I'm going to zip through these. I just want to get to one slide. I've got all of these cases. We've tried to tra track them so that if you want to look them up and look up the, the details of the indictments or of the trial transcripts, you can, you know, we, we can help you with that. Here, 
Um, I just wanted to show you. So the, this, this San Diego ga gang um, um, indicted for pimping teenage girls and children, nine members of the Oceanside uh, street gang. Um, they uh, were making 1,000 per night per girl, so that was the quota that they had. That meant 30,000 per month, um, given the number of, of um, girls they had, 500,000 per year per gang, um, you know, per whatever um, stable or brothel, multi-millions funneled back into the gang and circuits all throughout Southern California. And so this is not unusual. Um, I think uh, Zach Terwig um, Terwilliger and um, uh, Michael Frank also have done some calculations of how much the MS-13 members were making, and it's similar to this. It's $500,000 to $750,000 a year that they're making. They're multimillionaires in a, in a couple of years, and they're very powerful, and what do they do with all this money? Yes, some of it funnels back to the gang, but a lot of it they're using to bribe police officers and um, and, and to buy, you know, um, um, good um, defense lawyers to get these uh, young women back out of jail again or to, to get themselves out of jail. So they become very powerful if we're, if we're not um, on top of this. Um, okay, I'm going to, here's, here's a list of some of the gangs. I'm going to zip through this now. This is the Zetas, also very, uh, I might have a really terrible slide in here and I don't want it, so. MS-13, and then I wanted to just get to this because oftentimes I'm just talking about the problem and I'm not talking about the solution. And I really think with street gangs um, that it's, uh, it's about communities and communities of care. And that what we need to be doing is working at the community level. Yeah, the prosecutions are fine and the, you know, uh, the arrests and the convictions, that's great. But we need to be getting down under, uh, you know, underneath that. And particularly because as I'm Talking to these survivors, they're telling me about their boyfriends who are members of the gang. And some of these kids, I mean, these kids didn't have a chance. They were born into these families. They were born into families of gangs. Um, they were raised in it. Um, they were the runners first, and then they had to commit a crime in order to be, you know, to, to um, mark their manhood. And then they were forever on the outside once they'd com committed a felony. So they're already at age 12, 13, 14 years old. They're cemented into these, into these, the, these, um, uh, their, their communities. Um, yes. And, and so what we need to do is begin to take that apart from the ground up. And so what I would like to do, these are all the legal recommendations, but I'm hoping that some of us can begin to work on the, um, Start with the gang member uh, or the victim and the immediate family and the relatives and the close friends and the neighbors and the acquaintances and the churches and the schools. All of those are concentric circles of care and each one of those is an entree and a level or a place at which there might be a way for us to begin to reach people and work with them. And the street gang members too, when they're young especially, they're still a hope, there's a, the exit strategies. They need exit strategies as much as the females do. Um, I'm not saying they don't get into the, to, to being hardened guys who use machetes to, to, um, to traffic, which, you, know, which you, you saw in some of these, uh, these cases. They do, and sometimes they're, when they get there, they're beyond repair, and then you lock them up. But if we start early and young and begin to talk in the communities, just like we're talking about pornography to, uh, to our kids now, or we're hoping to, to get that going. We need to be doing the same thing in these communities where street gangs are active, and I think we will have, um, you know, we will begin to have success. And there are some, um, some success stories. I don't have any more time, but I have them here, recommendations of what NGOs can do. Um, you know, billboards, the same kind of billboards we're doing for trafficking and for pornography. We can hear gangs have a special place for your kids and it's the graveyard, right? So that's powerful. It doesn't say much. It's just, you know, it's like your brain on drugs. Just simple. You don't have to do too much more than that. Um, here was a gang awareness video campaign where they had middle schoolers and young high schoolers create short videos about gang um, membership and about gang lifestyle and about what needed to be done. And having kids think about it and be creative in their solutions, I think, is also a part of the solution. Here's another, um, uh, watch the, whoops, I'm sorry. That's it. 
I'm going to go here. Watch the, anyway, um, there are a couple of, of programs like this, and I have them listed with um, the websites at the back of this, this um, video presentation or this PowerPoint, which I'm happy to share with you. I do think there are some programs that are working. One I love in Canada is a, a, um, a, uh, an NGO that purchased uh, a Hummer from the police department that was used by a gang member and then they put anti-gang kind of bright colorful things and they drove it into every community and the kids could come in from the school and get on the, the um, anti-gang um, you know, um, motorcade and, and look at it and get a little short lesson, not a lecture, but kind of a short lesson and, and where to go or who to talk to if they uh, have something they want to talk about. And, um, and uh, so these kinds of activities I think are, are important and they need to be a part of our anti-trafficking strategy. Mm -hmm.